From the Flint Hills Writing Project, this is The Suggestion Box, where teachers get ideas. I'm your host, Andrea Marshbank. Welcome, welcome to our very first successful Wednesday publication. We moved our publication day from Monday to Wednesday just because of some things happening with our social media account and some really cool stuff happening in the Suggestion Box podcast family. We now have a new social media manager, Bobby Rookstool. Very excited to have her on board. So thank you so much for your patience. We really appreciate it. The Suggestion Box podcast is the definition of grassroots. We're very small and we just are doing the absolute best we can. So thank you so much again for your patience as we figure things out one step at a time. Today we have the absolute joy of interviewing Jose Wilson, who is a math educator for a middle school in New York. He has done a plethora of great things for the world of education, including starting many movements that uh, involve diversity in education, as well as writing his own book, This Is Not a Test, and keeping a very successful blog called thejosevilson.com. I highly recommend you check it out. He is making waves over there. It's an amazing, amazing place to get consistent writing from Jose. So we're going to talk to him a little bit about the process of his project-based learning in math, specifically with a project that deals with scientific notation, as well as his style of inquiry in the math class that really puts the power back in the hands of the students, which is so important, especially in math. So let's get started. Today we're here with Jose Wilson, and I'm so excited to be here talking with him for a variety of reasons, but one of the main ones is that the way that I came across his writing uh, was really impactful to me. Uh, he writes a blog, The JLV, that has been widely acclaimed across education for a really long time now, several years, uh, and it's won a ton of awards. And more than that, it's just an excellent blog, like forgetting that it's it's just got like accolades out the whatever. It's just a very, very well-written, very like meaningful blog, and that hit me because I think that my blog at the time was much more of a like reflection versus Jose's like his, his words were changing things. That was really cool. And so as a response, I bought his book, This Is Not a Test, which was also a really great uh, exploration of just an amazing amount of content that really seemed like it was going to affect the world. And, and so reading Jose's work really like pushed me to be a better writer and a more, a more, a writer that took more risks, let's say like a writer who, who wasn't there to just uh, live in my own bubble of education. And so I really appreciated that, out that. And so when I reached out to him, asked him to be on the suggestion box. I was so excited when he said yes. And so that's who we're here with today. So how are you doing today, Jose? I'm all right. How are you? I'm doing well. Thank you so much. Uh, yeah, today we're talking about um, a couple of ideas that you have, which is kind of new for us. We haven't done that in the past. It's usually kind of been like one and done. So what um, can you tell us a little bit about the two ideas that we discussed previously that you want to share, that you want to suggest with our listeners? The first big idea was around scientific notation, specifically how um, I use the scientific notation project as an interdisciplinary project, but also as a means for gauging any number of, uh, I guess, math practices within within students as a collective, but also individually. My scientific notation project um, was sampled from many number of sources, but um, I found it helpful when I saw someone from the Marilyn Burns project uh, come to our school and and do it with my students. Obviously, it was fascinating to me how uh, the person who was doing it, uh, I think her name was Nikki Rizzo, um, she did it with my students, even as some folks said that they were not able to do it or that she, because she came from another school, that she wasn't going to attempt it with my students. Um, of course, once I saw it done and then and I was asked to take it to completion, I was like, oh, snap, like that actually really could work. And not only that, but I can actually extend it even further. So the scientific notation project is a, is a, um, it's a piece where we 
try to model the solar system first collectively through our own guessing and then through actual scientific calculation and then we scale it according to whatever parameters we're given so in the first section um we're attempting to say well what if we had this whiteboard uh, where would you put the planet and you know students would guess where the planet is depending on it and usually you get some sort of even distribution of where the planets would be and you would get similar sizes for every planet mm -hmm. um and then through some sort of uh, research and um some actual mathematics we start to see that there are degrees there are levels to how massive a planet would be and how big the radii are and then how um, how distant they are from the sun and then from each other, right? So yeah. um, through all that, we then start saying, okay, let's look at our calculations from before and did that match up with what, a, what we actually had, you know, guessed? And nine out of ten times, uh, the answer would be no. So from there, then people start making their estimations around how uh, far everything is and we have a pretty good scale model on the board. And then... You know, I say, okay, thank you for your time, and then I just, I let it go. The next day, without having remembered anything, because I try to insist that students just take first notes, like not very many, um, we end up saying, oh, well, what if we did this on this given piece of paper? Um, it could be a chart paper, it could be a small white paper, um, and then it's, it forces students to then say, oh, snap, like, I actually have to do the calculations all over again for this given piece of paper, and I have to scale, I have to do it to scale. Um, and I try to give them as little help as possible in the project. So um, most students do pretty, pretty well on it, given what they've already experienced. But of course, there's always a, a couple of showing students, and there's a lot of surprises in it too, but generally, I find it to be a good project for students to get together and really start thinking about the math that's in front of them. Yeah. Do you, so when you're when you're implementing it the very first time on the whiteboard, do you help them out there, or is that more of a self discovery? Like a lot of it is self discovery. I like to ask very few questions in the beginning. So like I'll just say something like, "Well." Um, what do you notice about these magnitudes? So they'll look at the exponents and they'll say, oh, it's not that far away. And then it's like, wait a minute, if we quote unquote move the decimal, right? Because that's always the, the trick there with scientific notation. If we try to get um, this magnitude just changed a little bit, or this degree changed a little bit, um, how much does it affect the distance? And uh, then they start to see, oh, it affects it a lot um, compared to what we see around here. So, um, yeah, I'm not that helpful. Not that helpful. <laughs> I feel like that's probably super helpful, though, because it's it's teaching them how to figure it out on their own, which is the ideal, right? <laughs> yes, yes, that's the idea. Yeah, that's really, okay, that's really interesting. And it kind of just naturally leads into this this other part that we had kind of talked about weaving in throughout the podcast. And, like, how do you use, is this the question technique you use throughout the rest of your course? Or is there, how do you ask questions in the math class? Well, you always want to come into a class having, you know, a couple of questions that you would like answered. So that's kind of how I like to frame my lessons. I like to say, what are the questions that need to be answered by the, the given time period? So if my lesson is a one-day lesson, what would I like to have answered by the end of that? What would I like students to have answered, I should say? And then um, if it's a two-day lesson, same sort of thinking. Um, so... Yeah, I mean, my questions are end up being scaffolded. Like, it'll be simple. It's like, um, what, you know, how do we um, how do we multiply numbers in scientific notation? So that's one way. And, of course, that has multiple um, entry points for that question. Mm -hmm. But then another question would be, like, how do we compare um, two numbers in scientific notation? You know, what, what are the best ways for us to do that? And of course, that has multiple answers too, but it has less correct answers than the first question I gave. Um, so I mean, any, any number of things. So it, it's just the number of questions I might have, but then also degree of, of approaches, I think is the best way to say it. 
So it's not so much difficulty. It's more about like how many ways can I approach these questions? And then I also tend to be flexible too. So I, I'm agile in terms of the thinking that I want with the questions, right? So mm-hmm. one thing that perhaps differentiates what I'm doing versus what I often see done is that um, my questions aren't about, oh, you got it absolutely correct. It's more like, oh, this is your approach to doing it, and you consistently use this thinking to approach this type of question. And so, yes, I can see why this is correct. So it's a different framework for approaching the, the answering to a question. Yeah, so... I mean, that's super, I know that there's a lot of, uh, like, those, like, fables that go around, like, my math teacher didn't like that I did it the wrong way, <laughs> and that, right. that seems to be kind of the opposite of what's happening. Uh, yeah, I, I can't, I don't like it. At the end of the day, with the kind of questioning uh, model that you've given the students or that you're using alongside the students, is it your goal to have them understand just one of the many ways to answer the question, or do you want them to have a concept of all of the ways? Like, which... Which is your end game? I generally try to go, like, if there are three ways to solve this thing, then I want them to be exposed to three. If there's at least 11 different ways of doing it, then that three is still kind of the minimum. If there's less than three, <laughs> then fine. We'll just go with the two or the one that people kind of have generated. But generally, I like folks to see multiple ways of approaching it because there could be those times when a student can explain it better than I can and it ends up uh, hitting the one or two students who didn't understand what I said. I'm like, oh, so that means you got it without me. Great, thanks, I could go. Yeah. You know, um, <laughs> the, the center does not have to be on me. It can, it can very much be about what other students generate, um, which is another kind of like shift in power, if you will. Yes, I, yes, I, I love that so much. The idea that like, I, it's a very simple idea, but the one that the the people in the classroom doing the most work are learning the most, and then this idea of power alongside of it. When we show our students, you know, like their agency, it can really, it can like unfold in really cool ways. Yes. So, what does this like look like in your classroom? Uh, so if you've got very like question-based lessons and we talked earlier about the scientific notation lesson which mirrored that in a lot of ways and you're so let's let's maybe focus more on the scientific notation so when you're going through this process with the students when you're asking them you on the second day when you hand them the piece of paper and say all right now you go you figure it out what is that like logistically look like for our teachers out there to get a mental picture. So you hand out the papers and you give them the question and like, do they collaborate with people around them or do they have to sit in silence? What does that look like? Well, I like to, when it comes to a project like that, it is very much about collective building of the knowledge. And then by the end, they ought to be able to go through an individual process, right? So uh, being able to say, oh, let's just make some calculations. Let's talk about what the project looks like. Let's make some guesses, or should I say some guesstimates, right? Mm -hmm. Um, And then build it from there. That's like the collective building of knowledge. And then eventually you want to wind down to the point where uh, the student can answer three three simple questions. One, um, did the estimates that came out of your work match up with um, the guesstimates that you had created before you saw the numbers in scientific notation or before you were able to scale it. Number two, what is at least one way for you to multiply numbers in scientific notation? And three, um, how would you um, use rational thinking to uh, create that scale? Um, So those are things... Those are things that are appropriate there. Um, yeah, so that's pretty much what it is. It's like going from like the, the macro to the micro. Mm-hmm. And I'm hoping through not just my own facilitation, but also through the students' own knowledge that they're able to just do it on their own. Not to mention, again, it takes the onus off me too because I can then focus on any number of students who may be struggling or groups that are struggling with the work. Um, I know people are not necessarily a fan of that. Like they want to have more individual work, but I'm just not, I'm not inclined towards it. I don't like it for any number of reasons, but uh, it's very much about focus for getting everybody to kind of build towards the individual, not necessarily having the individual, individual build towards the collective. Yeah. I think that that's especially 
remarkable, or at least with our image of what a math class is right now. Like I see, and maybe with every class, like I, I picture my own English class in my head. I'm like, oh yeah, we do a lot of collaborative work. But if I were to like watch a television show about an English class, it wouldn't be that way. So maybe I'm having like, I'm just kind of accessing those stereotypes about math, but it sounds really neat. So that's good. <laughs> uh, that's the point. Yeah, it's got a lot of things that sound engaging to the students. So you talked about helping your struggling students in that way. Like it allows you to kind of move around the room and help like different uh, different people with different things. Do you have any examples of students who have either with the scientific notation project or with a different project kind of grabbed a hold of this kind of way that you use questioning and either like it's helped them a lot or, you know, any challenges that have occurred throughout this this process? I think a lot this there's still a lot of work to be done as far as trying to tell uh people that math class um does doesn't need to be so individualistic. So there are folks uh who for whatever reason prefer the lecture sort of situation. They mm -hmm. prefer to be told exactly what they need to be doing at every single time. I mean, I'm someone who doesn't really put an agenda on the board. I may have an objective, but I personally prefer um, just having somewhat of a, of a loose classroom in, on, in order for me to be like, oh, well, I at least was able to uh, adjust accordingly. Because um, it always happens, right? Like, you always think, oh, well, I planned it for this, but... I'm disappointed because I didn't get through all of this, but I also met these things and I was able to clarify things for all these folks. So, um, I mean, those are things that I'm just thinking over at the top of my head. Like, um, I find that some students really, um, I guess that's the challenge is like how to get students to, uh, take, take that, like the onus upon themselves. I want I don't want to use the word ownership too much, but that's pretty much what it is. It's like be able to take some of that power and say, Hey, like I, I don't necessarily need to check in with my teacher every single time that I got it correct. Um, and, or, um, I hope they're ready when Mr. Wilson says, Oh, well, why would you ask me if you already know the answer? You know, those are, <laughs> those are things that, uh, I guess are the struggle points as far as I'm concerned too, because it's kind of like, okay, but I would say if we start school in September, I would hope by November, December, folks are just ready to say, hey, I can handle this on my own, and I don't necessarily do need to do all your work for you, or at least check in on every single thing that you do. So, um, th things of that nature are, are pretty much the struggle there. Yeah, I feel like that's that sounds a lot more like real life, or I I really I I hesitate to use those words because you know school is still life but it's the the I don't know the collegiate level or the workforce or you know kids who decide to become their own bosses later on in life and are like self-employed like that sounds like real life like when you you don't have the constant you know person in the room to check in with it sounds like you're developing these skills that are going to be more helpful to them uh than if if you did you know like kind of enable a little bit of their you know, as you said, kind of lack of ownership or even like a, like a little bit of like learned helplessness, like you're giving them their, their own legs. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's, that's the plan. It's very much about getting folks to just be more thoughtful about their work because, you know, as I keep telling students this all the time, like regardless of who's in front of you, as far as uh, teaching is concerned, you still have to find a way to get yourself to be, uh, I guess, autodidactic, if you will. Um, and I don't use that word, but I'm like, you need to be self-motivated because regardless of who's in front of you, you need to be ready. You need to make sure that you're able to uh, learn regardless of who's going to be guiding you through that learning. I'm thinking, and I think it's not just a mentality for um, for school, but it's also a nice mentality for life, being able to just say, hey, I can just self-teach and I'll do it however way, like whichever way I got to do it. Mm -hmm. um, and if the teacher wants to help me out do that, that's fine. But again, it's a shift in power um, and allowing for, you know, I guess, a, I guess a relational sort of conversation around learning instead of saying the teacher's just going to feed me all the information and I'm going to sit there and take it so I can pass this test, so I can pass this grade. Um, it's things for folks to think about. Yeah, I think that that's, 
the way we seem to be leaning more and more in education is questioning this idea of where where their motivation is coming from and where we're we're forcing their motivation to be when we teach in certain ways when we when we kind of make it so that they have to rely on us um but it seems like many things in their adult life are going to have to be them being self-starters right like if you don't if you don't do it yourself nobody will right right and it's you know i think i think that's where kind of inequity comes in too because we already know you know through various studies that not everybody who's in front of a bunch of our kids is ready um or is given the the proper amount of resources proper amount of um focus or expectations for that matter when they do come into a classroom so my my classroom i'm hoping is a way for folks to understand uh, how to survive in classrooms that may not always be hospitable to them by giving them that set of um, questions, that set of understandings about how to approach schooling instead of just saying, the teacher's going to give me everything. It's like, no, actually, I want you to have everything Mm -hmm. and you should expect that the teacher's going to be able to facilitate that with you for your own learning, for your own understanding, Uh, not just in math class, but in any other class that you're in. Yeah, I think that that's that's a really great way of explaining everything. So, did you know when you when you became a teacher, when you were going through like the journey that you did to become a, an educator, did you did you always know that this was the way that you wanted to uh, to have inquiry be in the classroom to give students, you know, their own, you know, uh, like agency and facilities to to learn, or did you kind of come upon it? Like, how did that happen? Gosh, I mean when you're asked to teach right like there is there are any number of sources that are given to you as far as how to teach but generally the way that i was told i need to teach or that i'm not even say told i just say like the expectation in society for how to teach in a urban school Mm -hmm. with predominantly students of color is you know you're the person in front you're the person in charge and everybody else has to obey whatever you say. Um, and I mean, it, there are folks who that works for, and, you know, I, I'm not necessarily going to judge them, but uh, <laughs> I thought, you know, over time, it just wasn't my personality. Like, I found myself trying to be that person, and it just became really hard to justify, you know, being that, uh, that having that militaristic pedagogy, be always having to be the person in charge, Mm -hmm. always having to be the person with all the answers. And not to mention, it was just wearing me out. So there's any number of students who it was like, wait, so you really expect me to have all of the answers all of the time? It's like, no, not necessarily, even though I might have all the answers, but that doesn't really help you with your own learning. So I came upon it through any number of uh, pedagogues, uh, folks who, and I, I, I mean, I'd be... I'd, I'd be hard pressed to tell you which exact one, but I, I'd say folks who've been following the works of Lisa Del Pitt, the work, folk, you know, who's been listening to Paulo Freire, who've been even listening to like Pedro Nogueira, like any number of folks who are about that inquiry based life, you know, um, that just became my focus. I was like, oh snap, like all I have to do is ask a bunch of questions and I could probably get way more out of asking those questions than me just having all the answers. Um, and me also being able to say, oh, I actually can walk away without having to be the one that says that was correct. Um, the, and th- that I was super helpful. I was like, I, I, that means I can get to other kids uh, who actually do really need my help versus those who are just kind of um, don't have as much confidence, but they actually do know what they're doing. So those are, those are things that just came upon what I was doing. Yeah, I think that you've got like you found what works for you and like what works for your students. How do they respond to this type of like uh, inquiry focused, you know, questioning, learning, uh, you know, maybe even in regards to like maybe their other classes or past classes or like what they thought math class was going to be like, like how, what is their feedback to you? Even when they don't necessarily like how I do things per se, or maybe they're just curious as to what I'm thinking when I do something they tend to like my class a lot. Um, that is kind of me being humble. 
because there's a lot of kids who are like, oh, he's my favorite math teacher. Oh, he's this, that, whatever. And it's not just because, like, I understand their language and I respect their music and all the other stuff. Like, it's, I think people get that confused because, you know, of course, a black male teacher being able to be responsive to their cultures and their, that, you know, the way that they speak and the way that they talk and actually listen to the music, like, yes, that goes a long way. But it really is very much about how I teach and what I'm teaching and how I tell students that they too can do it. Um, and then giving them ways for them to teach each other and teach themselves. Um, so, you know, though, there are lots of elements there. I mean, obviously I can never say I'm 100% perfect. I really wish, but that's the thing, right? Like you always want to be a better teacher every single day and maybe the conditions around you don't always allow you to be the best teacher ever. But I think what's allowed me to flourish is this idea that um, I am there really to get students to be their own teachers more than anything else and not just prepare them for my own uh, sets, my own set of learning, but also for them. Like just being able to say, hey, like, yeah, I'm getting to be a better teacher, but I actually want you to be better teachers than me. Um, I need you to be better learners than me. So that's, that's been it. And I think once people get a sense of that, then I can pretty much like do anything I want. <laughs> like, oh yeah. Like I see why you're doing that because you really care about my learning. So that, that's, that's been a revelation for me. That's awesome. That's, that's really great. That sounds like the ideal for, for everybody. Like I, that sounds fantastic. Do you think that in the process of questioning and how you do this, that like that you talked, you touched on how the trust you build with your students because you are like you, you speak their language and you respect their music and all of these different factors. Do you feel like that trust helps with, cause I, I know that I would have like way back in the day when I would have been, you know, the age to be in a math class, I would have been so nervous if like I sat down in a math class that wasn't like, all right, everybody pull out your homework. We're going to check it on the board. Okay. Did anybody get any wrong? And then like you go through the lesson in a very like uh repetitive and stoic manner and I actually like I was the kid that loved that class I was like this is my jam now I'm also the person who today like can't do math at all so there's that um <laughs> but like do you think that building that trust with your students helps alongside this inquiry where they've got like a lot of I'm sure there's a lot of discomfort like a lot of good discomfort but there's got to be some always I think that's, that's a good thing like we want learners to be discomforted in a way um and by discomfort i mean that i'm shaking them out of the premise that i have to be the one in power that's the, that, that's that's the discomfort there not like wow this person makes me feel kind of weird or this uh person doesn't really care about what i'm learning and it's just going through the motions or any number of things right like i need them to trust because that trust allows me the flexibility to say, I'm not going to be hovering over you. You need to take over your learning. Um, so it goes hand in hand. It's very relational that way. Uh, some people don't like it, but oh, well. Like, <laughs> <laughs> it, it's an extension of my own personality, which, like, I try my best to, like, um, to do what I can with what I'm given. It's, it's really the angle there. Um yeah, I mean, that, that's that's as far as I got, because it's just like, I, I'm kind of frustrated because I'm finding that um, people are hyper abusing the Danielson framework. They're hyper abusing any number of rubrics or any number of books out there that talk about um, having a high expectation for kids. But then there is no conversation around how to develop human beings that can um have some sort of self-determination or have some understanding of the world that's around them. And um, always being on top of folks doesn't always help them, you know, become, you know, I guess, liberation-minded, if you will. Folks who actually want to do this work without having somebody on top of them saying, oh, I, you know, I, I will dominate you. I have the power or else you have all these bad consequences coming to you if you don't follow my direction. Like that, you know, that, that deficit mindset is just not a thing for me. So um, those are questions that, you know, everybody always has, but it's like, I, I can't help you if you don't want me to help you share power. Like 
that that's that's been my struggle right now so yeah they have to like we have to be enabling students via like the time we give them and also you know like the rubrics we choose to to use or not to use we have to enable them to find the value in it themselves or else it really doesn't matter like it like I have and I think we've all had those students that like literally they go through the entire day and I don't have negative feelings towards these students I like I want to help them so much but it's almost like they could have not been at school and gained the same amount and that's a problem when you're doing this you kind of touched on rubrics a little bit like and a little bit of like when we when we're not aware of how we're using them we can kind of we can we can definitely we can stifle the education that we're trying to promote and create so in this process of you know inquiry and you've got like the project of the uh whoa I lost it. Hold on. The project of the scientific notation. So how, like, how does assessment look in your class? If your, if your process is more of like you building questions that you want students to answer, how does that look like from a point of view where you're assessing them? Like, how do you gauge whether or not they learned? Um, and then also maybe a little bit on like the, how, how does that make its way to the grade book? Because at the end of the day, most of our listeners probably, we got to do a grade book. <laughs> No, of course. You know, what I would say is like, you know, there's always going to be those requirements and compliance pieces. I can't knock that. So obviously, you know, I do have a quiz ready. Like It'll be like a three to five question quiz. I may do a reflection as well. Um, actually, I do do a reflection as well. So like there's the quiz where it's like, you know, here are the skills that you were supposed to uh, that you were supposed to know. Cool. But then um, there's also the reflection where. I may just ask folks, you know, non, I guess, uh, non-committal questions like, how was that project for you? How much did you think you learned? Um, you know, things that are formative. I mean, not, not that everything is informative for me because I don't believe in summative per se. Mm -hmm. uh, but I, I do believe that there has to be points where you can actually ask students what they felt like they learned or what they got out of whatever it is that you're teaching. So um, if and when you're given room for that, you should totally use it. So, yeah, I, I'm not <laughs> – you, you do your quiz, you do your test, great. You know, just to make sure you have your data, make sure, you know, you can cross your T's, dot your I's and all that. But um, I my assessments are pretty much verbal-like. You know, if I, if I can, like, ask somebody on the spot, how would you do that? Um, and they can give me a pretty clear answer, then that's an assessment for me. And mm -hmm. it was formative, and it told me what I needed to know. And usually, even just asking six random kids in, in a class of 30, mm -hmm. awesome. Yeah. I, th I'm sure that that's, like, you know, random sampling at its true form. You're probably going to get a really accurate version of what the class is feeling like. Uh, so you talked a little bit about reflection writing, which I think is great because I think writing should be happening in every single part of the, the curriculum, you know, cross curriculum and all that. How did like, cause how does your status or your like experience as a writer, do you talk about that with your students as you ask them to write reflectively about math? Because at my school, or at least in my area, I know that when my students come to their ninth grade math class and they're asked to write, like, it's really kind of, uh, it's, it's different for them. They haven't been asked to write about their process with math before. It seems that like sometimes that gets pushed over to a different, you know, to a different classroom. So do you, do you address like that you're a writer? Do you talk about that or is it casual? You know, the thing is about my life outside of school is I don't talk about much of it. Um, there's two functional reasons for that. One being that I think there's too much petty gossip that has happened in the last decade or so when it came to my blog writing and my, my presence out there, you know? So, um, that, that became a very real thing for me. And so I, I'm always cautious about trying to bring that into any space where it actually might get to other adults. Mm -hmm. um, and that's just being real. But then the second part, too, is like what often happens with folks who call themselves authors and all that other stuff. And yes, I am. <laughs> I am the only published author in my school. So uh, kudos to me, huh? Um, <laughs> is... 
I don't necessarily need to be the center. I, I prefer not to be. In fact, I prefer to just say, hey, uh, here's something for you to think about as you are writing because uh, I'm trying to get students to say to themselves, I can actually be better than Mr. Wilson at writing. Good. Thank you. Um, because I, I need them to be. Like, I need to be better at, at math than me. I need to be better at, like, life than me. Um because that, that's always my mentality is how do I pass on whatever it is that I can, you know, do without having to look like I am the power source, mm -hmm. you know? Um, it's like, cool. But, like, don't let adults always adult. Um, <laughs> it, it's it's what it is. And I borrowed that from uh, she and Francis Javari. It's always like this sense of adultism where because we are the elder ones, we always have to be the ones with all the knowledge. It's like, not necessarily. Like, there are things that folks can do way better than me, and I'm going to allow them. And there are things that folks can't do better than me, but if it's a student who's trying to get better than me, then I will most certainly give those tools away. Um, so those are things for us to think about, too. Yeah, I think that that's, that's a good way to describe it in a in a way that I think students can so, so easily like grasp. I, I struggle sometimes with my students. I get too wordy and my like, they're like, why are we learning this Ms. Marshbank? And I'm like, let me tell you. And I get really lost in the romance of like literature. And sometimes that's good. Like sometimes it's great to show kids your passions, but sometimes I think those real frank, like you need to be better at things than I am, than all of the adults you see. Because like, if you're not, like things don't get better. Like you have to be the better. Right, right. Um. That's really cool. I got like chills with that. That's really great. I'm so glad you brought that up. What advice would you give to teachers and like who are interested in exploring either like the uh, scientific notations project or the inquiry base that you've kind of described or any part of today? Like what advice would you give teachers who are listening? There's two elements that I forgot to mention. One is that you need, when it comes to questions and when it comes to everything, right, you need sufficient wait time. I think a lot of folks get uh, mixed up with, you know, thinking about successful classrooms, every hand is raised and everybody's excited to jump in. Um, not necessarily. If you're making a, a, an uncomfortable situation happen as far as like trying to get students to really think, then sufficient wait time is necessary. So what I like to do just quietly to myself is I count to 10 um, as I pick a student to respond, for example, or um, if I kind of see folks getting on the path and, you know, thinking about it, I like to wait. It's okay to be patient. Like, students don't have to give the answer right then and there. So that's one. I think, and connected to that, number two is the idea that there is going to be a mess. It, um, I'm not going to use the word fail, perhaps, but fa failure is often inevitable in situations where you're trying to get students to be uncomfortable. So um, if failure is a byproduct of you trying your best to get students to feel uncomfortable, then okay. Um, you have to learn how to manage that. It's going to be okay and being thoughtful about what failure looks like. If failure just means that the students um, didn't quite get to where you wanted them to get to um, in their thinking, then that's one thing. If the students just straight up did not get the lesson, obviously, then that's that's a um, something to consider. Mm -hmm. Something to think, really rethink. You know, the lesson, the approach, how you know how you ask questions, that sort of thing. But if it was just mm -hmm. like um, the students didn't get the model exactly correct. They didn't exactly know how to make the planets look the way I thought they would. Um, they forgot to account for the radius of the sun in, um, in their distribution. Um, even in the calculations, if they were off by a few uh, decimals, it's like, okay. I mean, those, again, that, that's room for error. Like, you have to be able to measure what your room for error is going to be, what your margin of error is, so to speak, um, and then build from there. But I really feel like, you know, failure is a thing that you're going to have to accept from the very beginning and then measure what your tolerance for that error is going to be. <laughs> because if you're trying to not be the one 
who has all the answers, then inevitably, and even, you know, those of us who think we have all the answers, we're going to fail, right? Um, and that's okay, too. But um, being able to put the onus back on students, being able to push away from you being the center, often inevitably being saying to yourself, yeah, I'm going to fail, I'm going to fail hard, but um, I-, I can get right back up if I'm given the opportunity to do so. Yeah, I think that that's, that's definitely the, the philosophy that I have seen be incredibly effective. And in a lot of ways, it, it sounds almost a little bit like process versus product in some aspects. And just this idea that we need to make sure our students are, you know, well versed in, in dealing with the mess, right? They've got to know how to handle their own failure and move past it. Yes, yes, yes. Well, thank you so much for coming on today. I really appreciate it. Thank you for all of your your wisdom and advice. And like, I have I have so much to think about about inquiry. And I'm sure that a lot of our math educators listening have you know a great new lesson idea if it if they can put it in their classroom. So thank you. Of course, thank you. If you enjoyed this episode of the Suggestion Box podcast, or you've enjoyed previous episodes, or you predict that you will enjoy episodes to come, please leave us a review on iTunes or Apple Podcasts. It really, truly helps get the word out. Please share us on your social media. Please follow us on our social media. We are on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. If you just search the Suggestion Box podcast, we will pop right up. We are available on iTunes, Google Play, and SoundCloud, as well as YouTube. If you have a suggestion or an idea for how we can make the podcast better, or simply want to give your feedback, please feel free to shoot us an email at thesuggestionboxpodcast at gmail.com or reach out to us via our website, thesuggestionboxpodcast.com. Thank you so much for listening, teachers. We'll see you next time.